starts right now. As Bear County climbs towards 1400 cases of COVID-19, two zip codes have emerged as hotspots for this deadly virus. Dylan Collier explains the notable reasons why. According to figures provided by Metropolitan Health, as of last night, only two zip codes in Bear County had 81 or more cases of COVID-19. 78207 near downtown and 78222 on the southeast side. 07 is home to the Bear County Jail, which has seen cases of the coronavirus surge the past week and a half. Health officials confirm the 129 inmates to test positive so far are counted as part of the zip code's total, since that is where they were being housed when they contracted the virus. 78222's inclusion at the top of the list is a bit surprising at first glance when you consider it's one of our less densely populated zip codes. But it's also home to several long-term care facilities, most notably in terms of this pandemic and tracking total cases, Southeast Nursing and Rehabilitation Center, which has had 74 patients test positive. 18 have died. They have a lot of kids back there. Dominique Jean Baptiste lives near Southeast Nursing. He said the tragedy unfolding down the street from him has provided more than enough proof that the countywide stay at home order must continue to be followed. I'll be keeping the kids inside. If, if, this, if this stuff needed to be done, I'm the one that goes out and does it. Dylan Collier, KSAT 12 News. And after weeks of being forced to close because of the COVID-19 pandemic, some businesses were allowed to reopen their doors and allow customers in in a limited capacity today. The Palladium, the Casablanca and the Santicos Theater in Cibolo reopened with reduced show times to allow cleaning between movies. 20% of the stores inside Ingram Park Mall are open with more expected to open over the next few days. All the establishments mentioned have implemented safety measures to try and protect customers and employees. Meanwhile, officials with the Woody Museum say they're working on a plan to reopen, but they aren't ready just yet. We are analyzing the safest ways that we can open to the public and making sure that we have all of those procedures and protocols in place so that when we do open for everybody, it's a wonderful, safe environment. Woody officials say it will take some time to implement their safety plan, but they plan on announcing a reopening date soon. In the meantime, you can check out some of the museum's content online. Just visit KSAT.com for more information. As businesses here in Bear County take a step to reopen, more rural counties may be able to take things a step further. The state is allowing counties with five or fewer active cases to have businesses operating at 50% capacity instead of 25%. Though Uvalde County has had six cases of COVID-19, it says none of them are active now. It's not on an official state list of counties that may operate with the larger capacity, but it is still moving ahead. Garrett Berger heads out there to see what that looks like. Uh, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. For restaurant owner Juan Martinez, it's a relief to have customers dining in at Jack's Steakhouse again after weeks of just takeout orders. It was pretty much of a struggle. There wasn't that much activity as we're used to. There's still not many people here, though. I think it's going to start off slow and we'll gradually start building the trust back to the community. But should they decide to come, there will be more space for them than in other counties. Like other Uvalde restaurants, they'll be operating at half capacity instead of a quarter. Health is our biggest concern here, but secondly is our economy. We have a lot of small mom and pop restaurants, mom and pop uh, stores and so forth, and they need to be able to open. There is a question of whether local officials are allowing the community to open up too much. The mayor and county judge have said gyms and salons may also reopen, though the attorney general's office has said that goes against the governor's order. Mayor Don McLaughlin says they'll let businesses decide what to do. If they want to open, that's their call. I mean, but they'll have to deal with the ramifications of the governor. In my opinion, I still think they should be able to open, but, you know, he's got the control of the licenses and so forth. The mayor didn't know of any such businesses opening. KSAT saw an open tattoo parlor as we drove around, though no open salons. And good nutrition, right? Back at Jack's Steakhouse, one customer was happy to support the restaurant and take a break from eating drive through at the park. But, you know, it's not the same as sitting down, nice big glass of IT, relax, lean back, air conditioned. In Uvalde, Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. And as Texas businesses decide whether or not they're going to open their doors, one lawmaker says it needs to happen now. Senator John Cornyn tells KSAT that it's about more than getting out of the house. He says people need to get back to work so they can provide for their families, which would then help the economy. The senator says while the state needs to move forward, it won't be the way it used to.
We found that businesses can uh, operate uh, with uh, many of their employees teleworking and not commuting into the office. Um, and uh, that has all sorts of implication. But we also have learned things that, uh, for example, we can't depend on on other countries for critical supplies of things like pharmaceuticals and medical equipment. Cornyn says there's also a sensitivity to the idea that a virus in China can shut down the world. He did add that he believes China should be held accountable in some way for not revealing details surrounding the virus sooner. When talking about the mortality rate of COVID-19, here's a factor you may not realize correlates. More than one in seven people living in San Antonio have been diagnosed with diabetes. Ursula Perry explains it could make the difference between a mild case and one that could take your life. Diabetes, it's the difference between a 6% death rate and a 28% death rate. Preliminary studies now showing if you have type 1 or type 2 diabetes and you catch COVID-19, you will have a tougher time surviving it. In San Antonio, UT Health doctors are now saying even a high blood glucose level will do the same. And even antibodies that we have uh, in our antioxidant system, they're suppressed by the high blood glucose. Um, and so we can't fight infection as well when we have a high blood glucose. To be sure, diabetes does not increase your chances of catching the virus, but it is likely to be a factor that allows complications to occur. So a lot of our population has a genetic predisposition to it. And uh, honestly, some of our eating habits make us predisposed to having diabetes. Um, so uh, so it's, a, it's a big problem here. A big potential problem, but one that's been held in check as compared to other big cities. Closing the schools early, um, you know, limiting the group sizes, even before the uh, shelter in place order, those things were happening. So we got a, a good lead on the virus. There's sizable concern that those who have hypertension and high blood pressure aren't even aware that they have these conditions and therefore they're unaware that they run a higher risk if they get COVID-19. If it runs in your family, be sure to get regular blood pressure checks. And now more than ever, try to have a healthy diet and avoid sugary things. Your life really now may depend on it. Ursula Perry, KSAT 12 News. Time saver traffic right now. Let's go out to what is usually under normal circumstances, a busy intersection 281 South. As you get onto loop 410 West, the upper deck, you can see it's a little busier than we've seen in recent days, but certainly nothing like we saw before we started shutting things down. Well, new at six, Pamela Oakley is being called a miracle patient. Her family says she only had a 20% chance of surviving COVID-19. Yet today, Jesse DeGregato says she was given a resounding send off by several hundred staff when she was discharged from Northeast Baptist Hospital. The first time Pamela Oakley heard cheers and applause by hospital staff, she didn't know why. Boy, these people are bored. They have nothing else to do around here. Oakley says later she was shocked to learn she became Northeast Baptist's first COVID-19 survivor to come off a ventilator. My faith is impeccable and um, God has a continued plan for me. Having already lost her son just over a year ago. This is just that one more thing that he keeps showing that he's here because medically speaking, I should not have lived. Recovery wasn't easy, having lost some of her motor skills after nearly a month in the hospital, 20 of those days sedated on a ventilator. So that's what's been pretty tough, is to understand what this has done to me. Yet here she was, able to walk on her own. Her reward? I know this is something you had been craving. <laughs> My chili cheese pizza. Oakley's message for others still struggling with COVID-19. You just gotta fight, you gotta pray, you gotta keep the faith, be in God's will. <laughs> Jesse De Bullado, KSAT 12 News. We wish her a full and healthy recovery. I mean, I, that's amazing. Those yeah. are the scenes we like oh, yeah. seeing outside the emergency room. The, Warm send -offs. Beautiful. Meantime, let's take a live look outside with live cam. Very hot, 90 degrees out there, Adam. Yeah, notice I said warm send-offs.
<laughs> I did. I, I picked up on that uh, little cue there, yes. And of course, nothing on the radar screen right now as we just have the high thin clouds overhead. The aquifer did drop nearly a foot today, and now we're 1.7 feet below the May average. Here's your pollen count. Mold, it's moderate at 960. Grass on the low end with a count of 60. Temperature-wise, right around 90 degrees from 88 in Bandera to 91 in New Braunfels, 90 degrees at Stinson and Castroville currently at 93. So those high thin clouds overnight will turn into low gray clouds by tomorrow morning. Temperatures falling through the 70s this evening, settling down in the 60s by tomorrow morning. Look what our high temperatures do. They can continue to kind of baby step their way upward all the way through Tuesday. That's when our next cold front hits. We'll talk more about that in the return of the humidity coming up. The Digital Public Library serving Bear County residents will open next week. Tonight, how this service is crucial for families during the coronavirus pandemic. Hollywood Park Police uncover a massive underground homeless city. We'll take you inside the half mile long tunnel tonight. Well, we are standing by for the uh, daily briefing by our city mayor and county judge. Uh, today's a big day here in Texas with the reopening of a lot of businesses, uh, not just in San Antonio, but across the state. Yeah, and I imagine they will be talking about that. Let's go live to City Hall right now. Tonight we're joined by Assistant City Attorney Liz Provencio. This is our nightly update on COVID-19 in San Antonio. Tonight we have now 1,477 total cases of COVID-19 in our community. That's up significantly from yesterday and the judge is going to talk a little bit about that as it relates to a cohort uh, congregated setting in the jail. Um, we also now had a bump in our recoveries. We have 683 people we count as fully recovered here in San Antonio and thankfully no new deaths to report. Uh, I'd like to turn it over to judge to talk a little bit about the congregate setting but first let me talk a little bit about our hospital numbers. Uh, we have a, an uptick in the number of COVID positive patients in area hospitals. We're up to 60 tonight. 42 patients are in ICU. That's up from five yesterday. It's up five yesterday and 21 on ventilators. We have uh, good strength again in our hospital numbers with regard to beds as well as ventilator capacity. As you may have heard, the judge, excuse me, the uh, governor announced a plan to increase testing in the state of Texas. Of course, that's welcome news here in the city of San Antonio and every major metro in our community. Part of that plan is to deploy 50 state guard um, run operations for mobile testing. All 50 of those teams, you should know, are being trained here in San Antonio. Once again, the state of Texas is looking for leadership and emergency response and has found it here in San Antonio. Those teams will be completely trained by tomorrow, and already six teams will be deployed here in San Antonio. We have one team that is going to be conducting a, um, a mobile site for testing at the Frank Garrett Center. Um, I also want to say thank you to our Hindu faith community who has recently donated 7,000 new masks uh, to first responders here in our city. The community has stepped up big, and we want to thank those members of our Hindu faith community for helping to protect our first responders. Do want to also note for those who are interested in our ABLE, we have a donation set up for masks, new masks uh, for the most vulnerable San Antonians, and that's going to go on a week from today from 10 a.m to 2 p.m. at TriPoint. That's at 281 and North St. Mary. So if you have masks that you'd like to donate, new masks to, to donate, you can do that a week from today. Judge? Yeah, thank you. Uh, as the mayor mentioned, uh, we had about 103 more tested positive yesterday, but out of that 103, 91 were at the jail, which means out in the community, there were only 12 positives. That's the lowest one uh, lowest 12, lowest number that we've had since we started. So that's a positive sign. Now, at the jail, uh, we are testing uh, uh, everybody that's uh, uh, asymptomatic, and uh, the numbers are running kind of high. Again, we don't know for sure how they pass it on to someone else, and if they do, if they do, how do, how do they do it? Uh, so we are segregating them to be safe and to make sure they're in a separate place. Uh, we did get an increase of some 18 yesterday, uh, bringing us to a total of 147 accumulative cases. of uh, It was 157, but 10 of them have recovered. So we'll continue the testing program, continue to uh, separate the inmates that do, posit do test positive, although they are not sick. 
but out of caution, we're doing that. And a general rule, I think you hold them for 10 days in, in that circumstances. Uh, the mayor and I did have a good chance to talk with the leadership of the uh, economic recovery group that they're presenting their report to a joint session of the commissioner's court and the San Antonio City Council next Tuesday. Uh, we're encouraged by what they've done. Uh, I know we all have different opinions of whether the governor acted too soon or not. That, that really doesn't matter. The fact is he acted, he made a decision, and now it's important on, to us that we handle it in the proper way. So when we had the report back from the health committee uh, last week, uh, we took a measures right after that to ensure that people would uh, a act in a responsible manner by requiring the face covering, by requiring the stay at home if, if you don't need to be out, particularly people that are vulnerable with health complications. Uh, we added to that uh, health standards that needed to be done by each business. So now we have the economic group coming back. While they cannot decide uh, when somebody's open, that's already been decided, and the mayor and the governor will decide again on May the 18th whether to expand that, depending on how good we do. So we need to do everything we can to, to, to make it work. Uh, what they'll be focusing on, I believe, when they talk to the council and to the mayor, they'll focus quite a bit on the small businesses. Uh, they, they, they have a much harder time. They have a harder time getting a loan because they don't have all the expertise. Uh, they probably have a harder time starting up of getting all the uh, uh, PPE equipment that they need, gloves and masks and uh, 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 sanitizers and hand wash. Uh, so we're going to be working on trying to get that to them. They're probably going to be needing some assistance in uh, training and, and, and in assistance in uh, maybe some startup funds, how they get going. So we'll hear that report, in uh, the full report, uh, next uh, next Tuesday. Uh, and then it'll be incumbent on the business community to follow that report and then for us to see where we can step up and help uh, the small businesses uh, be successful. Thank you, Judge. And, and we did get briefed a little bit about what to expect on Tuesday. So they're working towards a, a final product. And I don't know about you, but I was very encouraged that the economic team seems to um, be emphasizing consumer confidence as one way to get our economy back on its feet. And consumer confidence comes from an understanding that we have to conduct ourselves in a safe manner uh, as well as an economically strong manner if we're going to get everything back going again. So that's encouraging to hear. Um, I also want to thank you. Uh, uh, the entire community has rallied over these last couple months. The city, the county, the community all together to make sure that our most vulnerable San Antonians are being uh, taken care of. Uh, those folks who have uh, worked very hard on the front lines of this from the grocery stores to our health care workers, our hospitals, the teachers who have pivoted in dramatic ways. Thank you so much for all that you're doing. Keep up the great work. As always, you can get the latest on COVID-19 in our community by texting COSIG gov to 55000 or you can go to the website at covid19.sanantonio.gov as you know we do have uh, emergency orders in place stay home work safe um, and we have assistant city attorney liz uh, liz Provencio to help us uh, address any questions uh, and so we'll go to those now that's the very latest from Mayor Ron Nuremberg and County Judge Nelson Wolf with the latest numbers 1477 cases of COVID-19 in Bear County and the city of San Antonio. That is a dramatic rise. A lot of that comes from the jail and a lot of the discussion was about the jail today. 683 people have recovered, by the way. No new deaths to report. That's very good news. We still sit at 48. And just to clarify that for folks, the reason why the significant jump is because prior to today, they were not being included in these daily briefings, now they are included in those numbers. Um, the judge gave the example of 103 positive cases yesterday, 91 of which were in the jail. Yeah. So only 12 um, were in, in the community. Another um, major note was the uh, governor's announcement of his plans to increase Texas by way of mobile testing. All of those mobile units will be trained here in San Antonio. There's 50 of them. After that, they'll be deployed to different parts of the state. Six of them will stay here in San Antonio. Yeah, that's very, that's very interesting. And as a matter of fact, I think that training may be going on as we speak. 
Uh, it was also interesting that the judge talked about the number of asymptomatic inmates that have tested positive. He says there's quite a few of them. Didn't give us an exact number. He also talked about the economics transition team that uh, we will hear from next Tuesday as they give their report. Like the health transition team, they'll give their report to the city council and the commissioner's court next Tuesday. All right, let's turn out to weather 90 degrees out there, Adam. Yeah. Earlier today, we made it up to 92 for the high temperature after a morning low in the 50s at 58 degrees. And let's take a look outside at our conditions. Nice high thin clouds. You may have seen a little halo around the sun today. I talked about that at five and I'll talk about it again next half hour when we have a little bit more time. Now the average high is 84 and we're going to be well above that for several days here, at least through about the middle of next week. Here's a look at some of those cirrus clouds. Now when we have them right around and shortly after sunset, they make for a nice colorful sunset, but a lot of these are pushing on out of here and some folks along the coastal plain will have some of those for a colorful sunset. 90 degrees at the airport, 88 Helotus, 88 Comfort, Canyon Lake at 83. Meanwhile, 91 in Hondo and Divine at 92 degrees. There are a few other high thin clouds off to the northwest of us that could make their way into town by sunset, but I don't think we're going to have all that much color out there locally. It's folks east of I-35. Hey, Del Rio, 98 degrees at this hour. Dew points, not bad though. We don't have a heat index to calculate because dew points are low. We're in the 40s to near 50 degrees, so it's comfortable. That all changes tomorrow. We're going to have a stretch through the weekend and even into the early and middle part of next week with noticeable humidity and that mugginess outside. And then look at this, this little drop in humidity next Thursday. That's because of a little cool front that's going to affect us next week. With that cool front, I wish we had better rain chances. Right now we're just calling for a 20% chance Tuesday and Wednesday and then another 20% chance on Friday. Tomorrow morning, upper 60s, low 90s, both afternoons this weekend. You'll notice the humidity, low morning clouds and a little bit warmer as we get into next week before that cool front hits us and drops us to near 80 by Wednesday. Thank you, Adam. Larry has sports up next. Today is May 1st, the date NBA Commissioner Adam Silver set as the day he would reevaluate what happens next with the NBA. It's been seven plus weeks now since the league was put on hold due to the coronavirus. The NBA wants to resume the season, but doing so while keeping everyone safe is no easy task. And there are reports that some executives and agents believe the season should be canceled. LeBron James says no way. Here's what he tweeted. Saw some reports about execs and agents wanting to cancel season. That's absolutely not true. Nobody I know is saying anything like that. As soon as it's safe, we would like to finish our season. I'm ready and our team is ready. Nobody should be canceling anything. The NBA is targeted May 8th as the day some practice facilities can reopen for individual workouts with some limits like no more than four players at the facility at a time. The Spurs haven't decided yet if they'll open next Friday. So what does RC Buford telling guys who might be hesitant to show up to the gym? The first thing we tell them is your safety is top priority. And so we're going to do everything we can at the, at the appropriate time to create an environment that they can be comfortable in. There will be no mandated at a, uh, a, a participation at a point in time we, go, we do go back in the gym. We're really trying to provide for their not only physical but mental health um, in the best way that we can. The NBA Board of Governors voted today to indefinitely postpone the draft lottery and draft combine. Set for later this month in Chicago due to COVID-19. The draft is still scheduled for June 25th in Brooklyn, but it is expected to also be suspended. Pro football coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. Earlier this week, Texas State star linebacker Brian London II signed with the Los Angeles Rams as an undrafted free agent. London holds both the Texas State and Sun Belt all-time records with 460 career tackles, a number that also ranks in the top 20 all-time among all NCAA FBS players. He is a tackling machine. The Rams giving him a shot means the world to Brian, his family, friends, and the neighborhood he lives in. It's been, it's been huge. Um, my parents, they just, you know, just break out, just like smiling and just hugging me and everything. And my phone's been ringing off the hook the last, you know, a few days. So while, you know, COVID is going on and everyone's been social distancing, I've definitely felt the love via, like, uh, all different forms. And my friends and FaceTime with me, uh, social media. So uh, I definitely, like, everyone's, like, giving me a warm reception. They're just uh, proud of me and excited for me. 
The Randolph High School alum is excited to join the Rams in the City of Angels and the City of Lakers great LeBron James. Uh, hopefully, you know, getting the opportunity to meet LeBron. Uh, he's been my favorite athlete, celebrity, whatever you name it, uh, since uh, I can remember. So, you know, just it's going to be exciting. It will be exciting if he gets to meet him. I'll tell you about the Rams are getting a good one on this guy. You know, I'm kind of a Rams fan. I don't know if you knew that. Larry. I knew that. Yeah, so yeah. I hope he does well <laughs> for many reasons. Same here. Yeah, <laughs> thanks, thanks Larry. We'll be right back. It's our coronavirus Q&A where we take the fact out of the fear and some of the fiction that's out there surrounding COVID-19 and coronavirus. And you might remember earlier in this newscast, we talked about diabetes and just how prevalent it is in San Antonio and South Texas. Dr. Lisa Ochoa joins us. She's a vascular surgeon at the San Antonio Vascular and Endovascular Clinic. And we're going to talk about diabetes, but we're going to talk about much more than that. And, and doctor, thank you for joining us. The very first thing I want to talk about is what should people, now that we're reopening Texas and elective surgeries can be had again, what do people need to be looking for when they schedule these kind of things and then when they show up? Sure. So when patients now that are looking to get their elective cases done, meaning they're not urgent or emergent, I think the first question to ask is, does that need to be done right away? The answer is, it'd be better to do it sooner rather than later. I think the next question to ask would be, could it be done in kind of a more closed situation like an ambulatory surgical center where there's a less contact uh, with patients to patients and other people, maybe a more controlled environment. Uh, I think the other question a patient should ask is, should they be tested for uh, COVID-19 before their elective surgery? Uh, many of the hospital systems are offering what we call pre-admission testing or PAT uh, and offering before surgery that the patient go in and get that test done. It would think that that's a good, it would, it would appear to me anyway that that would be a good thing to get done before you have any kind of surgery. I do believe it'd be good to, to perform that test. There's some early studies uh, in China that suggest that even asymptomatic carriers of the COVID-19 virus undergoing general anesthesia, that they may have some more complications in that scenario. So for example, if you're a patient that has an elective surgery and you test positive, have no symptoms, but you may choose to delay that surgery longer. Now, Dr. Ochoa, I want to ask you about our peak. A week ago today, we had Governor Greg Abbott on this show during this newscast, and he said that the peak has now come and gone for San Antonio. What's your opinion and what's your assessment? Is, has San Antonio reached their peak? It's hard to say. I looked at the numbers recently and it looks that we're at least plateauing now. Um, it, we haven't seen that downtrend yet. Uh, I believe it's coming, I hope it's coming, but I have not seen um, that downtrend. And so I, I imagine we're at the plateau at the top right now. When we talked a couple of weeks ago, you were concerned that a lot of your patients with diabetes were not coming in to be seen. You weren't seeing the volume of patients that you'd been seeing. Has that changed at all? It has not. Uh, what I was also concerned about, not only just the volume, is they've been presenting at later stages in the disease process. So, for example, where usually I may see a patient when they first have a little toe ulcer and it's small and we can manage it well, I'm now seeing them when they have more severe infections in their feet. And that just makes the treatment algorithm that much more difficult and the complications from that challenging as well. Uh, so we still continue trying to get that message out to seek the care for your chronic medical conditions that you need. Are you concerned we're going to see more amputations because of this? It's interesting you say that. That's actually one of the first things that crossed my mind. I'm hoping that that's not what happens. I think it's important that we review all the data after this time period to figure out if that has happened, how we can prevent that from happening again, and maybe by more uh, outreach uh, clinics or care to those patients in these vulnerable communities to make sure that this does not happen. There's been so much talk about when and how things are going to get back to, to normal. There's that craving for normalcy. How do we get our medical care, just medically speaking, medical care back to normal? I think that's a great question, a really hard one to answer. I've been talking to several of my colleagues. Uh, we're all are very cautious. We want to see our patients and take good care of them, but we want to make sure we do it in the safest way possible. 
We still have limited information, so we're making the best decisions we can with the information we have right now. My uh, primary care colleagues I know have been doing telemedicine and they're slowly transitioning, opening their office to more and more patients and that's their plan. Uh, my plan is the same. Um, I'm still seeing patients in clinic, but uh, we wanna make sure we offer to see patients in person uh, and we'll increase that slowly as long as safely as possible. Some of the new studies that I saw that came out uh, over the last couple of days talked about the prevalence of blood clots uh, in some of the people that had tested positive for COVID-19 and maybe even perhaps leading to strokes. Your thoughts on that? So I have been following my colleagues on the East Coast and West Coast who see a lot more COVID patients than I have. And I've seen that they're seeing these, we call them hypercoagulable or prone to clots, that, that COVID virus makes them prone to clots, whether it's clots that can cause a stroke or clots in the legs and go to the lungs and call, cause what we call a pulmonary embolism. And they've been seeing higher rates of that. And so they began to talk about strategies. Do we start blood thinners on these patients sooner? Are those that have higher risks for blood clots, do we start them on full blood thinners? And so we're learning a lot of uh, more problems that this virus is causing. And I think making sure we keep in com communication with a specialist that helps me that if this patient comes in to uh, my hospital, I'll know how to manage them. Dr. Lisa Cho is with some wonderful and very helpful information for us tonight. Thank you so much for your time. And we'll see you, of course, on the news at nine. Thank you, doctor. We'll be right back. Want something to put on a shelf that is out of this world? Well, how about a 30 pound piece of the moon? There's one up for sale at Christie's. It landed on Earth during a meteor shower. And no, it's not made out of cheese. The auction house <laughs> says the fragment was discovered two years ago in the Saharan Desert. This piece of history doesn't come cheap. The asking price, two and a half million dollars. Wow. The sale is private as opposed to an auction, which means it can be bought immediately. Christie says it is the fifth largest moon piece available on planet Earth. Pretty impressive. Let's take a live look outside with live cam kind of hazy out there, it seems. Yeah, it looks a little bit like that from the south side camera. It's going to get a little bit hazier as we get into the upcoming weekend. Just the hazy, hot, humid conditions will be surging back into south Texas. We had a high temperature today of 92. We're right now at 90 degrees, falling to 75 at 10 p.m. And then tomorrow morning, we'll start the day in the mid to upper 60s. Get ready for a return of the humidity. We'll turn up the heat a little bit, and then another little cold front arrives next week. We'll talk about everything coming right up. In the buzz today, Taco Bell hoping to take Taco Tuesday to a whole new level. I'm excited about this. Are Starting you? today, the chain is selling, and that's because I'm not a fan of Taco Bell, but I think I am after this. Okay. The chain is selling at-home taco bar kits. The taco bars will come with enough food to feed a group of six with eight flour tortillas, 12 crunchy taco shells, and some tortilla chips. It's a great idea. Mm -hmm. No taco bar would be complete, though, without the seasoned beef, lettuce, refried beans, tomatoes, cheese sauce, cheddar cheese, sour cream, hot sauce packets. The entire package costs $25. You can get it delivered or pick it up through the drive through Taco Bell says it wanted to have the kids out in time for Cinco de Mayo, which is next Tuesday. Well, some good news for fans of hip hop superstar Drake. A new album is coming. Drake revealed on Instagram a new mixtape and a new album is in the works. It'll be Drake's first studio album in two years. But first, the mixtape. Dark Lane demo tapes with 14 songs and guest appearances from Chris Brown, Young Thug, and Playboy Cardi. It's all now out on SoundCloud. As for Drake's new album, it'll be out this summer. Well, iPhone users are having a bit of a problem unlocking their phones when wearing yeah. masks in public. The Face ID function cannot recognize them. Apple says they are working on it. In the new version of iOS, Face ID will recognize when someone is wearing a mask, and the iPhone will instantly pull up the passcode entry screen. That means no more constant searching for your face. The Face ID tool still won't unlock your phone unless you take your mask off but it will make the switch to the passcode unlock option significantly faster. When the fix will be available, hasn't been announced yet, and my chair just sunk. <laughs> You've got to take this shot. <laughs> you look like you're in one of those preschool I, chairs. I just went, whoa, uh, live TV. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, I'll stand with back. me. Yeah. That is awesome right there.
It reminds me of when you walk into like a kindergarten or preschool classroom yeah, and you go the for like tables are da down yeah, daddy yeah. donut day. You're yeah. sitting down the little thing. You know, back to that iPhone story, that uh, mask fix. I've noticed that issue and it gets frustrating. I noticed it just... with sunglasses. Oh, really? It doesn't recognize me with my sunglasses on. Hmm. Mine works with sunglasses. Really? Yeah, my, my, my I got my the big glasses. ones. You know? That's probably yeah. it. All right. Anyway. Okay, so I've got a really cool picture to share with you here. This is of a little optical phenomena we saw earlier today in some parts of South Texas. This is from New Braunfels. Thank you, Katie, for posting this. And when we see these halos around the sun, it's caused by the sunlight traveling through the ice crystals high in our sky and bending. And they bend at a 22 degree angle. And that's why we call this a 22 degree halo. So the clouds that are overhead are composed of all ice and the ice is actually hexagonal prisms. And when the sunlight goes into that prism, it bends and when it exits, it bends again. And that gives us our 22 degree bend in the light and creates that halo. We see it often with these high thin clouds that stream overhead. You can even see it in moonlight as well. Sometimes you get that little ring around the moon at nighttime. That's if you have these nice cirrus clouds overhead and there are some thicker clouds off to the west and we even see some thunderstorms flaring up this afternoon and some showers over the higher elevations of West Texas closer to Alpine Marfa area just north of Big Bend, well actually near Big Bend National Park. That action is going to stay out there. That's just terrain induced afternoon diurnal stuff. So here's a look at the activity, which is quiet across the majority of the state upper level high. It's slowly settling in and our overall weather pattern is flattening out and we're going to get into more of a zonal pattern where we have just a west to east flow up above us and that's a quiet weather pattern. It's going to be that way for several days. Right now we do have a little bump in the jet stream off to the north of us and then one big dip in that jet stream over the east coast. It's that dip that gives you the nice activity and the good shower chances. It's the bump that gives you well the heat or warmth this time of year. I mean, 86 in Omaha and North Platte, and you get down into the 90s here in Texas, and we're on the warm side of that, of the uh, jet stream, and we're gonna stay on the warm side and actually see our temperatures slowly rise a little day by day, all the way through the middle part of next week. Del Rio now at 98, 95 Carrizo Springs and Catula. Those are some of the warmer locations. Meanwhile, 84 Gonzales and Fredericksburg at 85. So it's a little hot out there, but we don't have the humidity. A lack of humidity in the air, giving us those pleasant conditions. It's a dry heat outside today. And I mean, compared to what we're used to here, it's really not even overly hot around town here. The humidity is going to be changing. Overnight tonight, southeasterly wind really does its job and what it always does, and that's boost our dew points. They'll be back in the 60s, so back in the muggy category. First thing tomorrow morning, and we're just going to put those dew points on cruise control through the weekend in about Tuesday, Wednesday of next week. So 67 in the morning on your Saturday, some low clouds to start the day. So if you're an early riser, you like to get that morning jog, bike ride, walk, whatever, just know that it may look like it's going to rain, but it's those clouds that just give you that dreary look in the morning. They burn off by about 10 a.m. Then you have sunshine, humid, low 90s all weekend long, and that's going to last into next week. We even boost those temperatures to about 94, 96 Monday and Tuesday, but I wouldn't be surprised if we're a little warmer than that on Tuesday. Then a cool front hits Tuesday night with it. Some cooler temperatures or not as hot conditions as we get into Wednesday with highs closer to 80 at that point. And unfortunately, no good rain chances, just a 20% shot here and there next week. Thank Steve, you your life size again. Yes, I am, but you know, I could go back at any time. <laughs> In case you missed it, coming up next. Here's today's in case you missed it. The FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, is allowing emergency use of an experimental drug in this fight against COVID-19. Remdesivir is the first drug to show positive results by helping patients recover faster. President Donald Trump made the announcement alongside the FDA commissioner. The drug will be available for patients hospitalized with COVID-19. New developments in the Bluebell Creamery's legal problems. Five years after a Listeria contamination case, the company is agreeing to pay more than $19 million in the case as part of a plea agreement. Several Bluebell products tested positive for Listeria in 2015, leading to inspections and sanitation issues that were uncovered at a facility. The Justice Department says the company enhanced sanitation processes and put a program to test products for Listeria 
in place after taking some time to update its facilities. Walmart expanding its two-hour express delivery service to 1,000 stores across the country, including stores here in San Antonio. Walmart started the pilot program in 100 stores in mid-April. Service costs an additional $10 more than the current delivery fees. The company says it hopes to expand to 2,000 stores in the coming weeks. Food Bank in San Francisco will be distributing 35,000 Wigo steaks that meet worth more than estimated $2 million. The specialized beef is a donation from Snake River Farms, a company based in Idaho that usually sells to San Francisco's restaurants, which of course are closed. Instead of letting the fancy beef go to waste, it will be going to a good cause. I want to tell my seniors, number one, we love them, we miss them a lot, and we know that no matter what, that COVID-19 may have shut down San Antonio, but it's not going to shut down their lives or their futures. Graduating seniors at MacArthur High School may not get to walk the stage this year due to the coronavirus outbreak, but they will have their caps and gowns. Northeast ISD celebrating the class of 2020 with a special cap and gown pickup day. From the safety of their vehicles, which they were encouraged to decorate, seniors were able to get their graduation gear. MacArthur faculty and staff were also there to help hand out the caps and gowns and celebrate the seniors. I love that. Yes. There's something we could all do. Yes. Yeah. Thanks See for you watching. on the night on the night beat and online at nine.